How about it for David K. Johnston, everybody? Hello, Mark. Hello, sir. I uh, addressed in the first half hour, a little bit anyway, of the situation that Rudy Giuliani finds himself in with this new lawsuit, which I guess has uh, recordings about certain things and uh, certainly allegations that are wide ranging from sexual harassment in the workplace, but also the selling of pardons for $2 million. I wonder if you can remark on this and, and just speak to uh, what we uh, can expect here. Well, this 70 page lawsuit is essentially a roadmap to criminal behavior by Rudy Giuliani. And at many points in the complaint, it describes action and then says there's a voice recording or the emails. Uh, the woman has, uh, according to her lawyers, all of Rudy's emails for a period of time, 23,000 of them, because he put her in charge of it. This is a woman, a middle-aged woman, who was offered a million dollars a year to go to work for Rudy. He only paid her 12,000. He said he had to defer paying her because he was hiding money from his wife, his fourth wife, I think, Judith, uh, from their divorce. Maybe she's his third wife. And then he didn't pay her. And, but it is the, the assertion in the complaint that there are video or audio recordings, voice recordings, and emails that support many of the things that should be very troubling to Giuliani. He's issued a flat denial. It's all untrue. A uh, little difficult to make that case uh, when you uh, have voice recordings. And the the discussion of the sale of pardons, $2 million each, uh, half to Donald, half to Rudy, uh, also includes an allegation that Rudy parked the money with somebody else so he could evade income taxes on it. Now, this is the only part of the serious items for which the complaint does not specify that there's a, a video, audio, recording, or an email, but one of the lawyers, um, uh, said last night on uh, Lawrence O'Donnell that um, uh, there are corroborating witnesses for this. And let me just point out one other thing. I read this 70-page complaint, and I kept saying to myself, this is a very well-drafted complaint. This is a very powerful complaint. I get to the end. It's signed by three lawyers, the second of whom is my wife's weekly tennis partner. <laughs> Someone, my, my wife and I have dinner with she and her, her paramour. Uh, you know, once a month or once every couple of months. Uh, well, boy, you, so you can provide perhaps uh, some real ongoing insight into this. By well, the way, she's a really, ahead. really good lawyer. Uh, she's done some legal work for me and refused to accept payment for it. So I've sent her over cases of uh, really nice uh, uh, wine that she likes. But yeah. is um, senility a legal defense, David K. Johnston? John wants to know if Rudy uh, was smart, whether he might claim that. He might. And, uh, you know, we don't. Uh, criminally try people who are not competent to stand trial. Uh, uh, of course, we don't do that. Um, but Rudy's continuing to hold himself out there as someone who is competent. Uh, on the other hand, he's 78 or 79 years old. And according to this woman, was popping Viagra all the time, uh, demanded that she perform oral sex on him while he was having uh, phone calls with Donald because it made him feel like he was Bill Clinton. And an obvious question is, why did she put up with that? Well, he owes her $2 million, and he made it clear that if she quit, he was never going to pay her. And there, the world is full of many women who have submitted to this kind of treatment. Uh, there's a federal judge in Galveston who is now in prison where he belongs, who called himself the Emperor of Galveston. He only hired uh, women to work around him who were dependent on that job and in some cases were involved in child custody disputes with their spouse or ex-spouse and uh, made it clear that, uh, you know, unless they did as he demanded, that uh, he would see to it that their child custody disputes went the wrong way and they lost their kids. Uh, he, by the way, was not convicted after being impeached because he made a deal to resign so that well, he spends the rest of his life in prison. His wife will enjoy, courtesy of you and me and everyone listening, the taxpayers paying his pension to his wife. Oh, that's wild. Just wild. Well, 
Giuliani is an embattled figure, and certainly the last couple of years of the Trump administration punctuated a lot of his uh, embattled uh, outcries about uh, everything from how Trump was being attacked by the left. He became such a, um, a Trump apologist. He was a regular on Fox News Channel, which was also you know the place that carried the water for Trump. Yep. And he he did seem to show up. You'd see these video clips uh, of him inebriated, or he, he seemed to be inebriated, you know. And it's suggested in this complaint that he was inebriated uh, from time to time, I'll say, or maybe much of the time. It was much of the time, but uh, enough that it was noted in the complaint. Yeah, there are a number of people who have said that Rudy has been pickled pretty much 24 hours a day for a number of years now. Um but that, you know, being an alcoholic is not uh, a, a defense, especially if criminal charges are brought. And this complaint is just, it is a roadmap for prosecutors. I, I even think you could construct out of this a RICO case, a racketeering enterprise case uh, regarding his, uh, his firm. Uh, this is real serious trouble for him, especially because of the voice recordings and the emails. This is interesting. I want to ask you, David, just to follow up on that. The the notion that you are addled in some way by alcohol or drugs isn't a legal defense. And, and I ask this sort of having just taken stock of what you also said about uh, dementia or kind of losing it or, you know, I mean, it, where's the law come down on one yeah. and the other? It's potentially a mitigating factor. And he can argue that um, if this goes to trial and if he's still alive by the time it goes to trial, uh, as a in a criminal matter, he can argue that he was out of his mind and try to sell that argument. But the burden is on the defendant in a criminal case in those matters. And I think Rudy Giuliani would have a tough time selling that. There are lots of functioning alcoholics in the world, plenty of them. Um, uh, secondly, in the civil matter, that's much not much of a defense at all. And if she can establish uh, clearly that he promised her the $2 million and didn't pay it, then her claim for compensation uh, is, is quite strong and quite clear. Um, uh, I don't know that either of these will end up uh, going to trial. I think the most important point is all of the points that it makes about him facilitating criminal behavior. He coached the woman. If you're interviewed by the FBI, here's how you evade their questions. I don't recall. I don't remember. Of course, know how to deal with that. Uh, you have to be credible about that. Uh, and you can be impeached on cross-examination about it. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think this is a very important. It even goes to the uh, extortion of Ukraine by Trump and the people around him. And it goes to the subtitle of my most recent book, The Big Cheat, how Donald Trump enriched himself and his family while fleecing America. Yeah, the that book was just uh, terrific. Um, look, all your Trump books have really been, as I've said before, you could needle drop them and you have just find that it's just a page turner wherever you start. But I, um, and it's not, and it's true. I mean, the, the, the Trump stuff is true. I, yeah. uh, I wonder how you, because we didn't talk to you last week and a couple of people are mentioning in the chat they missed you so much last yeah, week. Yeah, I, 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 I apologize. It, no, 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 it's... It, yeah, it's fine, but I we didn't, as a result, uh, even get a chance to sort of ramp up to this uh, town hall, and now we still haven't gotten your reaction to uh, these things that Trump said during the town hall. Can you just give us a second on that? I'm just curious what sure. your reaction was. I, well, first of all, I have a very minority opinion about the town hall. Um, Trump, you will notice in many of the scenes, was slumping. He wasn't sitting upright. He often didn't look Caitlin Collins in the eye, but he wasn't looking at the audience. And he showed in a number of points utter contempt. And if there was any doubt about it, it was when he called her a nasty person or a nasty woman. Um, I th the format was terrible. Uh, CNN agreed to uh, terms under which the only people in the audience were Trumpers. They may have been independents or Republicans, but they voted for Trump. And while some of them were critical of some of his behavior, this was not a representative audience. And furthermore, it's New Hampshire, which is certainly not representative of America on a demographic rate or racial basis. That said, I think that this was a real public service by CNN because 
people got to see Donald the way I know him to be. And they got to see how petulant, how petty, uh, how uninformed, how uh, uh, delusional he is. I'll, I'll settle the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. You know, nobody but a, a uh, complete cultist trumper would believe that for one second. And he wouldn't be tied down on all sorts of issues. So uh, for all of the, the flaws and faults in this, I think that there was actually a public service here. You're never going to change the minds of the, the cultist Trumpers. And you're not going to change the minds of people who understand who Donald Trump is. The group that matters are people who can be peeled off and have their eyes opened. And who, you know, will say, well, you know, I don't like who Trump is, but I like his policies. Um, those are the kind of people who can be peeled off. And I firmly believe, Mark, that it's really important that we get back to having a Republican Party that's, uh, as they used to like to call themselves, the party of ideas. Uh, that used to call itself the party of law and order, even though now it's calling for all sorts of attacks on law enforcement, uh, promising to... Uh, uh, do terrible things to the FBI and the Justice Department. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the party has just gone off the deep end and the most uh, far out irresponsible elements are calling the shots. And I, this is not good for the country. We need to have, have a strong, uh, uh, principled and idea-based conservative party. And that's what the Republicans have traditionally been, the conservative party. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I was deeply troubled by this Mar-a-Lago hosted event over the weekend. It was uh, Michael Flynn was at the center of it. And uh, Trump called in to this event. It's uh, There is a, quote, theology or uh, some kind of, uh, quote, Christian underpinning to all of this. It really put together the uh, the the preachers, the Custers, and the conspiracy theorists all in one place, and it was Marlago. And so yes. Trump calls in, Flynn takes the call and puts it on the public address system as the former president Trump tells Michael Flynn that he is going to be coming back should be he uh, elected, should Trump be elected. Flynn will be a part of his yeah. new administration. I wonder if you could remind us who Flynn is and uh, just, you know, he was at the center of this event. As I say, he was one of the organizers. Well, Michael Flynn was a general. So he rose way up in the military ranks. Um, something happened to him around 2014 or 15. Barack Obama, during the period between the 2016 election and Trump taking office 10 weeks later, very specifically told Trump, not to have anything to do with Michael Flynn. Of course, that meant in Trump's mind that he should embrace Flynn as tightly as possible because anything Barack Obama did was bad in Donald's mind. Uh, Michael Flynn was on the payroll of the uh, Russian government. Uh, there's a famous picture of him along with Jill Stein having dinner with Putin. And he was also paid uh, by Russian interests in Turkey. Uh, his conduct was unbecoming an officer, and uh, Trump finally dumped him after 28 days as his national security advisor. He, Trump then, after Flynn was convicted, he made a deal to get his son off the hook and to take the weight for his crimes. So that you got to, one level, you got to recognize this is a decent guy. I'm not going to have my son go to prison so that I don't go. So I assure you, if Donald was in the other shoes, he would send his three older children to prison in a minute to save himself. And uh, he then was pardoned by Trump, which is, you know, just one of the examples of the corrupt way Trump dealt with the pardon process. Yeah, Flynn's brother still hasn't been cleared yep. of his Jan 6 involvement. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that Flynn's are, you know, were both in government, uh, you know, uh, in the military. Yeah, um, I mean, that's not uncommon. You know, you have people. Right. No, no, Justin no, exactly. You just got on as an actor, and her brother's an actor. Uh, uh, you know, um, my eight children, none of them went into journalism because they're smarter than I am. <laughs> 
Well, no, I mean, and, and many families that involve law enforcement or the military, there is a legacy kind of service right. that continues. So, yeah, there's nothing damnable about that. But I think the point was that um, that still nothing has happened on, on the brother. Um, I, uh, but I, I mentioned all of this, and we have this conversation sort of in view of what you were saying about extremist aspects of the GOP sort of driving the agenda. And so that leads me to the debt conversation. I wonder if you could just give us a second on that. I was saying in the first hour that because the party, the GOP, and McCarthy's tenuous uh, hold on the leadership is being driven by the extremists in that party, I'm wondering if they really wouldn't do what Trump suggested they do during that town hall, which is let the nation default. So let me just step back from this a little bit. Um, the United States currency is the global world reserve currency. Uh, when I went down to Argentina before speaking at the World Investigative Reporting Conference in Rio, my wife spent uh, I spent a week in Buenos Aires. Uh, we discovered that uh, if you had cash, everybody would discount their prices as much as fifty percent if you can hand them U.S. Yeah. dollars, not credit cards, but U.S. dollars, because the the economy is so bad. The same thing when Egypt forty years ago when we went there. Um, we had, took $500 and turned it into the equivalent of $6,000 wow. uh, for a two-week visit. Um, the United States makes an enormous amount of money off the value of the currency. We print dollars. People buy them overseas. They don't come back into circulation here. And as a result, it's a huge profit center for us. Um, there is no problem selling American debt. Investors are lined up every day, even when interest rates were one and a quarter percent for many uh, treasury notes. There was no auction that wasn't fully subscribed. They were all fully subscribed or oversubscribed. So there is no problem here regarding uh, refinancing the debt and increasing it. Um, the problem is entirely a political one based on a lie. And that is the idea that your and my and the audience's household finances are comparable to the government. They're not. There is no comparability whatsoever. But our constitution gives our government, specifically our Congress, monopoly control over our currency. So long as the United States can borrow in its own currency, there is no limit to the amount of money we can borrow as long as people will buy it. Now, Let me just stop you there for a second, David, just to, to review what you've just said. You're saying this idea somehow that, you know, you've got to pay your debts or you there's a limit to what you can spend. And that that limit is what it is when they, you, they talk about it in terms of you paying your Visa card or American Express card. You're saying that's a false comparison. That's exactly correct. Now, I'm sure somebody in the audience is saying, oh, yeah, I got some Russian rubles from my great grandfather. Well, yeah, because Tsarist Russia doesn't exist anymore. Uh, if you bought a, a Confederate a script in the Civil War, it's worthless. Uh, unless you overthrow the government of the United States, you're going to get paid. On the other hand, China, which now has an economy that by some measure, something called purchasing power parity, is uh, larger than America's, much less per person, but larger overall, certainly on a par with us wants to become the dominant world financial power. They want the Remnibi, uh, their currency, to replace the dollar. If we default even once, it's over. Nobody will ever trust us again the way they have. It doesn't mean there'll be no trust, but they'll never trust us the way we have. There is nothing the Republican Party can do more to help the communist Chinese dictatorship in Beijing than to cause a default on our government. And why the Democrats aren't screaming at that at the top of their lungs is, is a bit of a mystery. Um, now, at the end of the day, I suspect that we will end up with some kind of a deal because you only need six Republicans to cross the line and vote for an increase in the debt ceiling. And there are still moderate, responsible, grown-up, adult Republicans, moderates, uh, in the Republican Party. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene is not the center of the party. She's at the far out edge. Lauren Boebert is at the far out, you know, crazy and, 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 and stupid, uneducated edge. But you just need a handful of Republicans. And if they're from safe districts, they can do this and they can defy Kevin McCarthy. Secondly, if this goes south, then the question is, well, who's going to be blamed? Uh, Biden? or McCarthy. And the problem for McCarthy, the House Speaker, 
is that the Republicans voted to spend this money. If we simply undid the 2017 Trump Republican tax cuts that were passed with not a single public hearing, never happened before in American history, not one public hearing, and the benefits of which went overwhelmingly to large corporations, the next year, 2018, corporate tax receipts fell by one third, one third. Donald Trump personally, uh, assuming he's paying taxes, had his rate cut 40% by this bill was very much designed to benefit Donald Trump personally. Uh, Even and as he messaged that it wouldn't have any effect on him. That's exactly right. It's but bad of course, for him. You know, if, if Donald says something, you should start with the assumption the opposite is true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and, and ordinary people, they got little bitty tax cuts. Um, for a married couple, the uh, amount you would earn before you had taxable income, because part of your income is not taxed, went up from, I, if, I'm, if my memory is right, it was $21,700 for a married couple to $25,000. Um, that's some, but not much. The 10% bracket was replaced with a 12% bracket, the 15% with a 22% bracket. Um, so you're saying and, the loss of that revenue, though, has left us in this place as much as any kind of spending on the part of the Democrats. It, it has. And more importantly, Mark, how was this financed? It was financed not through economic growth, but through borrowing money. And uh, we knew this when it was passed. The staff of the Joint Congressional Committee on Taxation, th they issue the uh, official scoring of tax legislation and spending legislation. They said you're going to have to borrow what they said at the time was 1.8 trillion, it's now up to 2.5 trillion. So we are, there was no tax cut in 2017. That's the point I wanted to get to. There was a tax deferral into the future plus interest. That's what happened. And so once you have authorized spending as Congress has, you know, you have a moral obligation and a legal obligation to pay your bills. Now there are ways to deal with this. The 14th amendment says, the debts of the United States shall not be questioned. Would that be upheld by the Supreme Court if the Treasury Department keeps selling tre uh, 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 Treasury debt? Boy, I'm, I'm dubious about that, given who's on the court today. Uh, Biden has other options. We have uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in gold at Fort Knox. And what the heck is good is that doing us? Um, he could start selling it. Uh, we have oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We could sell some of that. There's land. The government sells land every day. There are things that the administration can do, but they're only going to last as long as those resources can be sold off. Uh, uh, but if, if they don't reach a deal and we default, make no mistake about it, this is the Republican Party, however unintentionally, helping the rise of the communist dictatorship in Beijing. And working against liberty and freedom and all the principles this country has stood for for more than 200 years. Of the scenarios that we've got to wrap up, but here in the last minute or so, of the scenarios that you've just uh, talked about, it seems, even though it will be challenged at the Supreme Court level, like the 14th Amendment, essentially just ignoring this uh, congressional limit and uh, this, I consider it almost a hostage situation that, that the administration is yeah. in. You could ignore it and just at full speed ahead and and really make the point. And by the way, David, I would think you could message more effectively than the Democrats are uh, while doing it. You can talk about how you know childhood poverty is uh, one of the things that you know is going to be eliminated by these cuts that the GOP are insisting on, et cetera. I, I spoke today to a woman who's just about to turn 75 years old, and she depends on Social Security for 80 percent of her income. And she is absolutely terrified that she won't get her next social security check or it'll even be delayed because she lives on an incredibly thin uh, budget, as you can imagine. And, she, and she's a retired school teacher who graduated uh, 4.0 from college. Um, and, and she's absolutely terrified. She woke up in the middle of the night terrified over what this means. The Republican plan that they've put forward 200 and some page plan. Remember when they used to complain about how long bills by uh, uh, Democrats were? It calls for cutting benefits to veterans, the people who went out and put their lives on the line and came back in many cases, like my father did, 100% disabled veteran. We're going to cut them. 
um, it contains on 170 some of the 200 and some pages, tax favors for the fossil fuel industry. Additional favors to the tax favors to the fossil fuel industry. So it's not a serious plan. What they counted on was what they got. The TV networks didn't report that. None of the three networks, which I, I watch one and then rush through the other two on my DVR every night, uh, not a word in those reports. Uh, very rarely do journalists in Washington actually read the official public record. They go by talking point memos that they're given and access to people. And if one of the, if, if the networks had read this and all started out saying uh, the Republicans announced that they have a plan to reduce spending, but 80% uh, uh, of the pages propose more tax cuts for the oil, natural gas, and coal industries, I think the nature of our debate would be different. So, uh, so well said. And honestly, you've left us with some stuff I'd love to follow up on next week. One of those things is the way media is covering these major issues and major politicians. It seems so superficial and misguided, but we have to wrap now. I, I so appreciate you, uh, you spending time with us every week. Uh, the great David K. Johnston, everybody. Thanks, Thanks David. David. Hi, it's Mark. And I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped. And please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.